What I wanted to talk about today was about how we overcome these technical problems. Hi everybody and welcome to Photographer's Coffee Morning. It's just going to be you and me and today we're going to be talking about problem solving. Before we get into our main topic, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about where I've been and how the podcast's been going. If you haven't done this before, podcasting is something that looks really appealing on the face of it. It's having really good conversations with people that you want to know more about and sharing that with an audience. One thing I've found from this process is that actually it's not as easy as that. Now, don't get me wrong, the conversations are incredible. It's been wonderful talking to some absolutely amazing photographers, producers, etc. Some of the ones that come to mind are the conversations we had with Emma Alexander from Wizen. If you haven't listened to that episode, you owe it to yourself to go back and have a listen and see what she had to say. She is an absolute fountain of knowledge. Also conversations with people like Dennis Roy Coronel, Tom Barnes, some of the roundtable chats we had with an absolute plethora of amazing photographers. Can't say enough about how much I've enjoyed doing it and all the people we've been able to talk to. But over the last, I guess it's been six months now, one thing's become clear. Podcast fade is a thing. And if you've not heard of that before, pod fade is a practice where somebody starts out with the best of intentions, making a podcast with a really interesting theme, interesting topic, amazing guests, and over time it gradually wanes. Not because people don't enjoy doing it anymore, but because of the sheer amount of effort required to do it well, takes over and the thing fizzles out. So if you ever had a podcast that started up and you got four episodes in and wondered where episode five went, it's most likely pod fade. People get distracted, Podcasters do not make a lot of money. In fact, in most cases, they cost money. The cameras that we're talking to, the microphones that we use, and the time we spend editing all have to be paid for by something. And over time, it can be difficult to sustain that. I am determined that's not going to happen here. But you may have noticed there have been a few weeks where we haven't actually had a new podcast upload. And there are a bunch of different reasons for that. Chief among them is the fact that I've been pretty busy. Like Work has gotten pretty hectic. I spend a lot of my time educating photographers and photographers are busy right now. But as it happens, my own photography practice has also picked up as well. It turns out that I've been doing a lot more work than I'd expected to be doing at this time of year, gratefully, and I'm very happy about that. But also there have been a couple of technical issues. We started using a new platform, which will remain nameless, but essentially when you're podcasting, there are pieces of software required to record on my end and my guest. So if they're using their camera and microphone, it's saved on their computer, then shared and blended in the cloud and put together. So we get a nice high quality audio video file for both people. That isn't without issue and it's actually quite a difficult thing to do technically. And as a result of that, we've had some problems. I actually had three interviews that were completely corrupted because of using a new podcasting service. What can we learn from this? Basically, you need to build in some kind of redundancy every time you do anything because let's face it, nothing ever goes smoothly. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. It's just a matter of time. I think we need to learn how to be a little bit more forgiving. I couldn't have gone through and recorded more thoroughly on the other side. The person being interviewed was doing everything they should have been. It's just a fact of life. Sometimes the services that we use and when we relinquish control means that things can go wrong and there's nothing that we can do about it. Very often in our own photography practices, there are going to be situations where we're relied on to problem solve just like this. What I wanted to talk about today was about how we overcome these technical problems. For many of us, photography started out as being something that's purely artistic as an endeavor. You pick a camera up because you want to be creative. You want to make something new that people haven't seen before. Do something wonderful. But the difference between being a hobbyist or an enthusiast very often is your ability to overcome problems, to know technically how to get past a certain issue that your client might have. In some cases, that might be if you're a wedding photographer, understanding how ISO works and being able to go high enough that you can get a clean image and still produce something in low light indoors, rather than your image becoming a motion blurry mess because you tried to solve the problem with shutter speed. It can look like knowing the person who's an amazing food stylist. So when you turn up on set, your work looks incredible because you were able to recommend the right person for the job. At every level, being a professional is just as much about problem solving and technical understanding as it is about being an artist. So when we're developing our practices, these technical issues that we have can be a great learning point. I've actually learned an awful lot about audio editing, about upscaling, about remote recording, about sample rates, and these are all things that I would never even have looked at if I hadn't had a problem. A lot of these issues are opportunities to grow, or more importantly, to understand what you're good at and what somebody else would do better than you. So if you're in a situation where you come across these problems, 
and you don't know how to solve them and you don't have the means to understand the problem well enough to do it yourself, we all have options. If your camera isn't performing in high ISO, you can always go out and buy a camera that has better higher ISO performance. If you are in a situation where you do not understand SEO, you can hire a specialist that will help you to optimize your site or teach you how to be better at SEO. If you're in a situation where you want to learn how to color correct more quickly or efficiently, you can contact somebody like me and I can help you learn how to color grade. Knowing your strengths, knowing what you're good at, and knowing where you need assistance is the mark of a professional. If you cannot provide a professional level service across all areas, there are people in your community that you can reach out to that will help you to do that. There are pieces of technology and techniques that you can learn that will help you to be a more consummate professional. This is kind of a little bit autobiographical at the moment because for me, I've realized that I need to change the way that I'm doing things if I want to continue to make these podcasts. And this episode's a prime example. We're talking to each other today. It's just you and me and a camera. There is no guest. And the main reason being that once those technical issues arose, I spend the time that should have been taken up scheduling those guests, overcoming those technical issues. And in that time, I released a few solo episodes on YouTube that haven't been on this podcast feed that have actually done really, really well on YouTube. And that kind of comes to another element. If you are doing something technically and you come across a problem, sharing the solution with other people is something of huge benefit. Try and find out if there is a way of you sharing the information that you have in a way that will bring everybody around up. If you don't share the information you have, that's absolutely fine. It is your prerogative. It is time consuming to do that. But be aware there are rewards if you decide to share things. Those videos I published on YouTube were some of the best performing on my channel. And I'm really quite happy I did it. One of the videos that I made during this time was highlighting some of the focus issues that have come up on the Fuji X-H2S camera in front of me. And it was kind of a bit of a scary thing to do because admitting that you found a problem, sometimes people can see that as a failing in you. I was genuinely worried before I published that, that people would think that I was the problem, that I was incapable of focusing a camera and it was nothing to do with the equipment. So being able to show with examples and spend the time and put that together and see people come and tell me that, no, I've experienced the same thing was massively validating. Tech support is part of the job. If you're a professional, a client is going to expect that you understand how your equipment works and how to get the best out of it. And if that ever ceases to be the case, or if you don't know enough, you can turn to sources of education to help you to understand. The fact of the matter is a lack of knowledge or inappropriate equipment can genuinely cost you time and money. It can cause you problems on jobs and not being fully aware of how your equipment works can be devastating to the outcome of a project. So I really encourage you, try and find people that can help you to understand if you don't. Seek out new equipment as you earn more if you can and try and make sure that you have a full understanding of the equipment that's already in your kit bag. A little bit of knowledge is really, really powerful. And there are an awful lot of commercial photographers out there that are using equipment from five or 10 years ago with thriving business practices. The important thing there is that they've chosen equipment that is appropriate for them and they know how to use it inside and out. If that isn't you and you feel like you need more help, feel free to drop me a DM. I'm here to help. My Instagram DMs are always open. I'm always happy to get back. Or if you prefer, you can use the comments below if you're on YouTube. The fact is you don't have to do it alone. Like nobody's expecting you to understand everything perfectly. You're a professional photographer. You are not a digital technician. You are not a camera expert. You're not, you're not any of these things if you don't want to be. If you feel like you have the capacity to be your own SEO expert, your own marketing expert, you know, your own sales department, that's fine. You can do that. But at the same time, if you want to focus on being an artist or being a technician or being any of these things, there are people in the ecosystem that will benefit from you not being proud, but sharing that work. You'll both grow faster. Imagine if your client said, we can take our own pictures, they'll be just fine. That might be true. They could be fantastic hobbyist photographers. Their business might thrive just as much with their own photographs they're taken on their iPhone as the ones that you've taken for them. But the fact is, you know you can elevate their brand. And it's the same in other areas. You might feel like an amazing editor, and that may well be true. Would you be benefited by understanding more about how your editing software works? You may feel like an incredible marketer. Would you not be better off with a PR company helping you to grow locally? 
when you look at opportunities to grow, don't just think, what can I do? Think about who can I bring in to help me grow faster? The money that you earn as a photographer can be seen in a multitude of different ways. But one of the best things I ever did for my business was bootstrapping. When I earn money, a large proportion of that money goes directly back into the growth of my business to try and make sure that I understand what I'm supposed to do next and I surround myself with people that can help me to grow. You might have heard this podcast before that I have a business coach, Joe, and she is fantastic, like genuinely fantastic. I'm not just saying that. But having access to her on a daily basis has meant that my thought processes are clearer. I can get good insight as to whether or not the ideas that I'm proposing are good or bad. And having a sounding board even has been something that's been absolutely pivotal to my growth recently. Even to getting this podcast out on time, like genuinely, if I didn't have her reminding me that I had this to do, I wouldn't have published once, never mind basically every week since the beginning of the year. Having access to people like Joe has been vital to my business. And maybe you don't need assistance with that. Maybe consistency is fine. Maybe social media management is fine for you. But there are going to be areas in your business where you may not be the best person for the job. And finding reliable people you can outsource to is a big part of how you level up. But I guess the question is, like, how do you know the person that you're reaching out to is going to do a good job for you? Like, We need to try and help share this information. If you have an amazing vendor that you want everybody to know and shout about, drop it in the comments. Drop me a DM and I'll try and share it. I want as many people out there to have thriving businesses. And I want there to be a solid ecosystem built around advertising photography businesses. My part in this, I offer education products to photographers. If you want to learn about backup and how to get a secure system that would keep your client's images safe and give you a plan if a disaster struck, Workflow, my educational offering, is designed so that you can pick up again after a fire in your house and within half an hour be back to editing and within a few days be back to full strength with multiple backups of your work. I never want you to be stuck. I never want you to be caught out. And if I feel that way about this one offering, there are other educators that can help you in other areas. If you wanted to understand more about how to advertise your business, learning about that can be a massive benefit. And if you feel like you can't just learn the process, trying to find somebody that offers it as a service might be the right option for you. We aren't all capable of being equally good at every aspect of our business. Similarly with color correction, You might be the kind of person that wants to be the artist first and focus on the shoot and forget the rest. But the fact is, as a photographer, shooting is half of the equation. Back in the day, if you were a film photographer, you would select your film stocks, you would choose a lab, and you would have them do that side of the work for you. But the film stock that you chose and the lab you decided to go with had a huge impact on the way your images look. And right now, understanding Lightroom or choosing a post-production house or an AI software even can do that work for you is now vital to getting the results that you actually want. Outsourcing doesn't necessarily have to be a relinquishing of control if you do it with intention and you understand the trade-offs that you're making. If you want to know more about the direction for your color correction, how your visual identity affects your brand, I can help you with that. Feel free to drop me a DM. We have a course and workflow called Visual Identity that is designed specifically to address this. And if you want to provide a vendor recommendation for somebody that does incredible post-production work, feel free to send me a DM or drop it in the comments below. Again, we're here to support creators. And in the end, a strong visual identity is something an editor will be happy with because it makes their job easier. In Tom Barnes' interview, he talked extensively about how the vast majority of his clients booked him because he was capable of shooting both photography and video on the same project. And if he wasn't going to shoot it personally, he would bring in a team member that was capable. So exactly the same way, if you're a photographer, it's time to get to know some videographers or learn to add that as a complementary service to what you offer. Being able to be a one-stop solution for a client is incredibly beneficial, especially in the commercial space, but equally in the wedding space. You have the option to be the person that says, yes, we can do that for you. And either provide the referral to your friend and feed a friend, or provide it in-house by bringing somebody in and contracting that work in and doing it yourself. Being able to shoot video and photo is a huge benefit. I want to show you how to extend that visual identity from your stills work to video so that when a client does come to you, they don't just do it to tick a box and say, yes, we have it. It's so your identity matches with stills and motion. So like I said to you, today's episode has been a bit of an odd one. After a series of technical problems, it can be very easy to allow yourself to be derailed. 
And like I said, thankfully, I've got a good community around me that helped me to pick myself back up again, helped me to get back on track. And I really hope you have that. If you don't, I really want to help connect you with other people that think the way that you do. Read the comments. You're not alone. All that said, to summarize, podcasting is incredibly time consuming. Technical issues are inevitable. And tech support is basically part of the job. If you can't do it, find somebody that can because that allows you to offer a client a complete solution. And don't forget, your business can be an ecosystem that can feed your friends. If you're in a situation where you feel stuck, reach out to those people and see if anybody in your network knows somebody that can help. Things grow faster when they grow together.